Well, hello everybody. Welcome back uh, to this series on the Bible science and a smidge of philosophy. So uh, if you have just tuned in and this is the first video that you've looked at, we're looking at gene expression and the genetic code today, although we have been looking at uh, DNA and replication and we have been looking at the philosophy of science and the scientific method and things like that. So go back and watch those videos if you want to. So in this series, uh, unlike some of my other formats, uh, this is a lecture format. Uh, so in the lecture format, basically it's like a lecture. So this is what I, I do in class when I'm teaching in university. I have a lecture format and so it's kind of like something like that. So uh, as I said, uh, in this lesson we're going to be looking at gene expression and the genetic code. I'm going to get into some details. I mean some people might say look these are mundane details about how the genetic code works but this is fascinating stuff so I'd encourage you to stay tuned. However if you want to move on uh, there are some creationist concepts uh, further towards the end of the video but I encourage you like I said to stay tuned because this is absolutely fascinating as we learn about the genetic code and how proteins are made. Okay, so first of all, let's look at gene expression. So gene expression just means the making of proteins. Uh, and there are three main players involved in the making of proteins. Uh, they are messenger RNA, transfer RNA, ribosomal RNA. And uh, we will talk more about those shortly, so don't get too stressed out about that. Uh, but before we go there, we do need to talk about chromosomes really briefly, chromosomes and genes. So uh, chromosomes, uh, basically inside the nucleus of every cell in your body, and so here is a cell, here's a cell, here's a nucleus that's inside a cell, and inside the nucleus of every uh, body cell or somatic cell in your body uh, is a bunch of DNA. And uh, presently, that DNA is all sort of scrunched up into kind of like a spaghetti format. But when your cells divide, uh, that DNA actually condenses, and it condenses into chromosomes, the things that you are probably familiar with if you've seen them on TV and CSI shows and things like that. So when uh, the cell replicates, that's when you get these uh, condensed chromosomes. And that's what I'm going to be talking about because it's easier to understand uh, DNA in that sense. So here are a couple of chromosomes. And... Uh, humans have uh, 46 uh, chromosomes. They actually have 23 chromosomes that come from the mummy and 23 chromosomes that come from the daddy. And just for simplicity, we'll call the red one here the one from the mummy and the blue one the one from the daddy. Now, these chromosomes are in homologous pairs. That simply means that the chromosomes have the same gene characteristics. So here, for example, is our two chromosomes, the, the one from the mummy, the one from the daddy. And notice they've got different letters. Uh, you've got G, G, R, R, S, S, T, T. Um, these letters, so G, for example, represents a gene, represents some trait uh, that we have. And it could be eye color, hair color, fingernail length, freckles. It could be a whole bunch of stuff. It could be uh, for some protein that's inside of your body. So uh, these are called genes. And genes are located, literally located, spatially somewhere on your chromosomes. So, for example, here is a gene uh, here, here is a gene here, here is a gene here, and here is a gene here. Now, it's, it's important to know that both of the chromosomes carry the same gene. However, uh, one gene might have a slightly different set of instructions. So, for example, it, the gene might be for hair color, but perhaps... Uh, the gene on the father uh, might code for blue eyes, while the gene on the mother might code for brown eyes. So that's the only difference. It's the same gene, uh, they carry the same gene, but they're slightly different. And we call those different genes alleles that are on those different chromosomes. Okay, so that's just kind of a basic summary of what chromosomes are, what genes are, where they're located on chromosomes to help us understand what we're going to talk about next. All right, so gene expression. Gene expression has two parts. Uh, we have transcription and translation. Transcription occurs inside the cell nucleus. Translation occurs outside the cell nucleus in the cytoplasm of the cell. So here is our cell. Here is the nucleus and uh, your DNA is inside the nucleus. Your chromosomes are inside the nucleus uh, once that DNA condenses. And of course, your genes are obviously inside the nucleus as well. So transcription occurs inside the nucleus. 
and translation, which is actually the, the synthesis of proteins, that's actually the making of proteins, it actually occurs outside the cell in this area called the endoplasmic reticulum, and this, uh, all of this, is called the cytoplasm. That which is inside the cell, but outside the nucleus, is called the cytoplasm. All right, so what happens during transcription? Well, in transcription, literally, uh, a message is transcribed. So here is uh, a DNA molecule. We've already looked at this in prior uh, videos where you have the DNA, which is wound into that helix shape. In the nucleus, what happens in transcription is you have an RNA polymerase. It's kind of like a little nano machine. Remember, when we looked at uh, the replication of DNA, you had DNA polymerase. Well, in RNA, you have an RNA polymerase. So here is our DNA molecule. It's split. It's cut by this RNA polymerase here. And uh, the RNA polymerase actually uses one side of the DNA as a template in order to transcribe the message that is on the DNA. And that message is a gene. And that gene are instructions telling the cell to make a certain kind of a protein. So notice also that the RNA molecule, so this is the RNA molecule, this is the thing that's being transcribed, right? Notice it's a different color, this purpley color. It does not have uh, two rungs like DNA. DNA has two rungs in it. Uh, it's double-stranded, but RNA is single-stranded. And that's one of the major differences between DNA and RNA. Now, another difference are the actual bases on the RNA. So notice on this DNA molecule, uh, and again, I'm, 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 I'm assuming that you know something about this or you've watched previous videos, uh, you've got A for adenine, cytosine, guanine, and you've got uracil here. Well, uracil is essentially the same thing as thymine on the DNA. So on DNA molecules, the thymine, well, it's thymine, the base is thymine, but on RNA, it's uracil. It's, it's confusing, I know. It's like, hey, why can't we just have thymine on the RNA as well to make it less confusing? Well, we don't. So it's actually uracil. And notice that the uh, RNA polymerase here is actually copying. It's using this side of the strand as a template, but it's actually copying the gene that's over here. So notice adenine goes with this adenine, cytosine goes with this cytosine, guanine goes with this guanine, and this uracil goes with this thymine here. So this is the gene sequence that it's actually copying. And so this is essentially all that transcription is. It is the making of a gene sequence. It's the duplicating of a gene sequence. It's putting it on uh, this RNA molecule so that it can be sent out of the nucleus and uh, proteins can be synthesized from it. So here's a little animation of what we've just seen. So here we have the RNA polymerase and the RNA polymerase now is going to unwind the DNA strand. And now it's using the bottom rung of the DNA strand as a template and so it's creating that messenger RNA. And notice that it's actually recreating the uh, gene that is on the, top, on the top rung there. So here you've got our messenger RNA that is using that template in order to create uh, a gene in an RNA sequence on that messenger RNA. Once it's done, it then will dis, uh, disengage itself from the DNA molecule like it does there and it will head on outside of the cell. Now, uh, there are a whole bunch of other things going on that we're not gonna talk about in this video, so that particular mRNA molecule actually has to be processed, and that occurs in the nucleus, and we're not gonna get into what that means. You've got exons and, and introns and things like that, um, adenine caps, etc. but we're, just, we're not gonna talk about that. Um, essentially, just, just uh, for, for, the, for the purpose of this video, think of this messenger RNA, it gets processed, Okay, and now it's uh, making its way outside of the uh, cell nucleus. So here's the nucleus, and here's a pore, and you can see this messenger RNA. Looks like a big long worm. It exits through this pore, and it's going to arrive at this part of the cell in the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so if you're interested, you can hang around for the quiz. Uh, go ahead and put it on pause because I'm going to be uh, going through this pretty quick. Uh, let's see how much you learn. First of all, what does homologous mean in terms of the chromosomes? Go ahead, stick it on pause. 
um, but the answer is B. It's two chromosomes that have the same genes, same gene sequence on them, one's from the mummy and one's from the daddy. Okay, where is the cytoplasm? And the answer is, it's outside of the nucleus, but inside of the cell. When exiting the nucleus, the mRNA, that's the messenger RNA, attaches to what? It attaches to the endoplasmic reticulum. And the mRNA molecule is what? Is it single-stranded, a nucleotide, double-stranded? Is it the same thing as DNA? And the answer is, it is single-stranded. What nanomachine creates the mRNA? And the answer is RNA polymerase. And how many chromosomes do humans have? And the answer is... 46. Okay, so let's get into translation. So again, this occurs in the endoplasmic reticulum. It's outside the nucleus, but still inside the cell. So translation is the second major process. And this is, I mean, guys, don't miss this. This is fascinating stuff, what we're going to see. Um, there are other, two other plays involved, tRNA and rRNA, and we'll talk about those. And while we're discussing this, we will be in a position to begin to understand what the word information means uh, when we use that in relation to uh, DNA, the information on a DNA molecule. Okay, so we're going to talk about the genetic code. We have to talk about the genetic code in order to really understand what a tRNA is. And of course, we need to understand what the genetic code is in order to understand what information is, because this is where the information resides. It resides in this genetic code. So the genetic code are triplets of bases, and those triplets of bases occur on mRNA molecules. Well, actually, they occur in the DNA as well. Um, so here is a DNA molecule, and uh, notice it's got two strands. That's why we know it's a DNA molecule. But every three of these bases on this DNA molecule represents uh, a code or, or a codon or that, that will get transferred over to the messenger RNA. So here's a piece, a single-stranded piece of mRNA, and uh, we know it's RNA because it's single-stranded. So if we take three of these bases, uh, bases here, adenine, guanine, cytosine, well, that's a single codon. That's one part of the genetic code, and that particular codon is going to code for either an amino acid or it's going to code for a stop or start instruction. So that's what a codon is, and the codon appears on the mRNA. So here is our mRNA, here is our codon, and we can actually find out what that codon codes for by going to a table like this. So if we look here, it says first base. So the first base is an adenine, so we go down here to A, well, that means that the amino acid is in this big box. Then we go to the top of the, uh, the chart here. Notice it says second base. And the second base is guanine. So we go over here to G. We go down. So we know now that it's in this box, the answer. And then the third base is cytosine. So that means that our answer is serine. So that means that this particular codon that appears on mRNA, it... Um, codes for the amino acid serine. Fascinating stuff, guys. I, I hope you think so as well. Okay, so that brings us to tRNA. So tRNA is called transfer RNA simply because it transports amino acids. I mean, you can think of it like a delivery truck. Here is a tRNA molecule. It's a, it is a, this is the 3D shape that it comes in. And here's an amino acid that's attached to the end of the RNA molecule. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, you should be, hang on a minute, I thought you said RNA is single-stranded, but this one seems to be double-stranded. Well, it's actually not. If you have a look, it starts here, it goes around like this, and then it comes back on itself. So this particular RNA molecule, it's an RNA molecule, but it's folded in on itself. Notice how the bases are connected uh, throughout this uh, RNA molecule. So it is RNA, but it carries a, a specific kind of amino acid. Now, on this RNA molecule, tRNA, there's something called an anticodon, and it also consists of three bases. And you're thinking to yourself, okay, hmm, codon, anticodon. Sounds like they go together, and in fact, they do. It's a match for the codon on the mRNA. So here's our codon. Here's our anticodon. You can see that the bases match, 
And in fact, that's exactly what's supposed to happen. The mRNA is going to attach to the tRNA, and that is going to send a signal to the ribosome, which we'll talk about shortly, in order to produce a protein. Okay, so that takes us to the ribosomes now. What are they? Well, you can think of a ribosome as essentially like a factory floor. Um, if you have a factory, uh, and that factory is making things, the mRNAs are making things, uh, they're coding for things, the tRNAs are making things and coding for things. However, they can't just sort of do what they do in a vacuum. They need a substrate. They need a, a, basically a factory to work in. And that's what the ribosomes are. Ribosomes are like the factory for the uh, making of proteins. And so uh, the ribosomes, although they don't look like it here, that's these two parts, the small subunit and the large subunit, they are made up of folded RNA strands. So it doesn't look like it in the picture. They don't, it sort of does, you can't see all the bases and things like that, like you can in the mRNA and in the tRNA that we've seen so far in those illustrations. But it is composed of RNA and it makes this particular 3D shape. So we have these two subunits, the small and large subunit, and what happens is the mRNA sort of slides into the ribosome, kind of like uh, the tape did in those old ticker tape machines. Remember those when you were a kid? Well, certainly, if you're over the age of 40, you probably do. But you stick the mRNA molecule, or, or the tape, I should say, in the ticker tape machine, and you can go ahead and emboss the tape, and you see the, the tape coming out the other side of the ticker tape machine. Well, that's kind of what happens with the mRNA molecule. It goes in one side of the of ribosome, and it comes out the other side. And in the meantime, uh, what happens in the middle is the actual uh, uh, synthesis of proteins. So let's have a look at how that works. Okay, so here is a, you can see, I've got a tRNA molecule here, and there is an amino acid at the top. And here is the anti-codon here. It's got cytosine, uracil, and guanine, it looks like. And notice that this uh, tRNA is making its way over to the ribosome and it's actually going to dock in this port. Notice that the port is called the A port. So in ribosomes or on ribosomes, you have three ports, an E port, a P port, and an A port. The uh, names are pretty complex and biological, and you don't need to know that. Uh, for my class, I just tell my students, just think of the A port as the arrival port, the P as the processing port, and the E as the exit port. And as you'll see, I think they're the names that should stick. So you've got our tRNA, it comes in, it arrives in the A port, the arrival port, and notice uh, we've got our, our codon facing down, and it's facing down, and it's gonna attach to uh, the, sorry, this is the anti-codon, it's gonna attach to the codon on the mRNA. So let's go to this slide to see that. So here it is. Here is our uh, anticodon attached to the tRNA. It goes into this port, and notice we've got the codon down here, and notice that these letters match with these letters, and when these, uh, these come together, then that sends a signal to the ribosome to start creating a pr the, the, the protein. So notice there's a tRNA already in the processing port over here. And notice it has a chain already of amino acids. Now, once you have a chain of amino acids, essentially that's a protein. Once you've got amino acid chains, you've got a protein. It might not be folded, it's not specified, but it is a protein. So what happens is when this tRNA lands in this port, the, it tells the ribosome to take this growing chain and move it over onto the amino acid for the tRNA that arrived in the arrival port. So notice what it does. See the arrow? And then it gets moved over. And then the one that's in the processing port moves to the exit port and it gets kicked out. And then you have the same process starting again. And eventually you'll get a growing chain, uh, a growing protein chain. So here is our mRNA molecule. And now it is going to dock into the small subunit of the uh, ribosome. So the larger subunit is going to come along shortly, but that's the small uh, subunit uh, for the ribosome. Here comes the tRNA, and the tRNA, of course, is going to dock into the codon section. So you've got the anticodon going with the codon section on the mRNA. Here comes the larger subunit for the ribosome. And now it's all ready to rock and roll. So we already have a tRNA that's in the processing port. It has a, 
um, amino acid attached to it. Here comes a tRNA, comes into the arrival port. The uh, amino acid that's on the tRNA that's in the processing port gets knocked over onto the amino acid uh, that was on the tRNA in the arrival port. The one in the processing port then gets in the exit port and leaves. And that allows another tRNA then to come into the ribosome. So here it comes. It's got its own amino acid. And of course, once it arrives and docks in the arrival port, that growing chain gets moved over onto that amino acid. And so you end up with a protein that's being created here. Okay, so here is... Uh, a slightly more accurate version of what we've just seen. So let's have a look at this again. So here is the mRNA, and this is the ribosome. And these things that are flittering around here, that's actually the tRNA. So the tRNAs are coming in, and they're leaving behind their amino acid. And so you've got your amino acid chain, which is actually a protein, which is growing. And again, just blows me away that this, this is going on inside our cells all the time. And again, Guys, this is the 30,000 foot view here. This, we haven't even gotten into all of the different uh, biological uh, factors and proteins that are actually involved in this process. Th these are just the basics. So we're talking about specified complexity on steroids here. Okay, so then what happens? Well, the protein is made, and then the protein actually has to be folded. So we're actually gonna talk about that. Now this here is the nucleus of the cell. Here is our endoplasmic reticulum, and these little yellow things here, that's actually the ribosomes. So let's play this video. So here's the cameras coming in, zooming in onto the ribosome. Here's a kind of a protein that just got created out. We're dealing with another level of complexity uh, on top of what we've already looked at. All right, and I think out of all of the proteins that uh, our body makes. I think this one absolutely blows my mind every time I see it. So these are motor proteins, and you can actually see this motor protein actually using its feet to walk along a microtubule superhighway that's going on inside of your cell. So here is the microtubule, and here is a vesicle which is full of stuff that your cell needs. And here you can't quite see it, but you will when I turn the video on. Here's the motor protein. And that motor protein is going to use the microtubule to, to deliver the material inside of that vesicle to somewhere else in your cell. So what, let's check this out. So there it is. I mean, just check that out. It's got the feet, it's walking on that microtubule, and it's pulling its cargo along. All right. So now let's go and let's have a look at the microtubules specifically. So the microtubules that the motor protein was working on, they're also incredibly dynamic. And so uh, in this video, you'll see the microtubules actually uh, making themselves and then deconstructing. So they're constructing themselves and they can deconstruct themselves. They can do this on a dime. So this is happening in your cells all the time. And so these microtubules are obviously made of uh, themselves are made of all sorts of proteins as the motor protein that we just looked at as well. And so these are just some of the proteins, some of the things that your body is making. Um, there are many, many other kinds of proteins. I think uh, another one that sort of blows my mind is the ATP synthase. You've probably seen these in your biology class, but this is a rotary engine at work inside your cell. This is going on all the time. And those rotary engines are made of multiple parts that all have to be there in order for it to function. And so we've looked at a whole bunch of complex things. And um, in conjunction with everything else we've seen uh, in uh, the last six or so videos that we've done, I think we see compelling evidence here for design. I mean, this is really compelling evidence. So I want to take us back now to this video that I showed in one of the earlier uh, lectures that, that we did on the chances of a protein coming together. After everything we've seen, let's have a look just to really get our brain around how complex we are. When applied to the origin of life and the random formation of large biomolecules, probability theory clarifies the limitations of chance as a creative agent on the primordial Earth. For example, 
What are the odds a single protein could form exclusively through the blind interactions of chemistry? Our target is one smaller than average molecule made from 150 amino acids, each aligned to ensure a folded chain. Researchers have calculated that on the ancient Earth, the probability of success was one chance in 10 to the 164th power. That's one correctly sequenced protein chain for every 100 million trillion 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 failed attempts. Okay, so to get your head around that number, 10 to the seventh, 10 to the seventieth is the amount of atoms we've got in our universe. So we're talking about essentially something that is impossible, and that is just for a, a small protein. We're not even talking about uh, DNA. We're not even talking about the complexity of the genetic code here. We're just talking about a protein. So um, again, I think compelling the... evidence for intelligent design. And of course, uh, in the previous lectures, we talked about the biggest problem for abiogenesis, and that is the formation of life from non-life. And it is information. And we've just seen information. We've seen it. It's a code. It's literally a code that codes for very, very specific things in order for those things to be made and be functional. Now, you don't get information from nothing. Information comes from information. We know that it is a scientific fact. Information comes from information. And that's why abiogenesis is never gonna work because you're talking about random non-information becoming information. Okay, let's look at one last thing here, and that's irreducible complexity. So we looked at this video a couple of lectures ago on uh, DNA replication. And what I want to draw your attention to here is, again, the proteins that are being made by the process that we just saw, which is through transcription and through protein synthesis. Notice the DNA made the mRNA, which made the protein. But here we have the RNA, which is being replicated using the very proteins that were made through the sequence that we just talked about. Well, that brings us to a problem. What came first, <clears throat> protein synthesis or DNA replication? Do you see the issue here? All of these parts have to be working and they have to all be there at the same time in order for the system to work. This is an excellent example of irreducible complexity. In other words, the design is irreducibly complex. Everything needs to be there in order for it to work. Um, so just a, a, great, a great concept for us to, to consider. Okay, so uh, again, just to, to finish up, complete this particular video, uh, I think the best explanation for what we see for life is that a powerful being, and I'm going to call that being God, created life much as we see it today. Again, don't let the things that we've seen just pass you by. Look, you can get online and you'll read someone who will give you some half-baked explanation about how possibly in some extreme uh, case, may maybe, possibly, something could generate some of the things that we've seen. Guys, that's a stretch. I mean, truly, uh, that is, uh, as as Paul says in, in Romans 1, that is suppressing the truth. The reality is that we see special creation, we see intelligent design all around us. And uh, yes, there are many unanswered questions. Hey, I'm going to be the first to tell you that as a young earth creationist. Lots of unanswered questions. I mean, that's what this channel is about. But can't go past what we've looked at and just reject it outright. Uh, surely, um, if we are thinking critically, uh, this is tantalizing, not just tantalizing, I think it's overtly amazing evidence for an intelligent designer. Okay, so that is the end of this lecture. I'm not sure what we're going to go to next, but make sure you tune in uh, for the next lecture style uh, video that I do. Uh, of course, please uh, subscribe to the channel, uh, ring the bell for easier access. Look, and uh, please hit the like button as well, because that really helps that uh, Google algorithm along. And so I'd really, really appreciate that if you were in any way blessed by what I had to say. 
Um, and of course, as always, please pray for me. I really appreciate prayer. Uh, with the videos, as you see some of the other videos that are shareable, go ahead and share them on your, uh, on your social media platforms, whatever it is that you have. So that's it for today. Thank you and goodbye.